and welcome. I'm Cynthia Corsetti, executive coach, author, and speaker based in Sewickley, Pennsylvania. With years of experience in guiding leaders to realize their full potential, I've embarked on a new journey to bring those insights to a wider audience. Care to Lead, a podcast dedicated to diving deep into the world of leadership. In each 30-minute episode, I sit down with inspiring individuals from diverse backgrounds to explore pivotal moments in their leadership journeys, the challenges they face in today's ever-evolving business landscape, and the legacy they aspire to leave behind. Together, we uncover valuable lessons and insights that can empower each one of us to lead with purpose, compassion, and resilience. So whether you're a seasoned leader or just starting your journey, join me as we discover what it truly means to care to lead. Today, we have Amit Patel, founder and managing director of Methos Group, a boutique management consulting firm that specializes in strategy, digital, HR, and organizational transformations, as well as leadership and executive coaching and talent management. Amit has broad-based experience in building and leading strategic and global transformations, resulting in cost savings, enhanced organizational efficiency, and productivity. Amit, welcome. And is there anything I've missed or anything that you'd like to add? No, you've covered whole bases. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be uh, on your podcast. We're so excited to have you here. And you were part of my Authority Magazine uh, series on driving disruption. So in order to get started and just, you know, stay on that topic for just a moment, I'd like to begin by asking you why you chose disruption as a topic that interests you and one that you wanted to talk about. I chose disruption because as a small boutique management consulting company, you're constantly faced with challenges, whether they are um, internal factors, you know, sizing, scaling up getting the right employee or talent in. Uh Sometimes you have to offload as well, picking the right client and the right engagement to work on. And then there are external factors that are simply out of your control, like the Uh COVID-19. These are things that keep you on your toes. And I thought it would be a good um, series to participate in and share my perspectives on on the, the disruptions that I've faced. Yeah, your your article was excellent, and it got a lot of a, a lot of hits. So that, that that's always a positive. Can you share a pivotal pivotal moment in your own leadership journey that maybe changed the way you approach your role? You know, um, that's a very interesting question, Dina. And I keep evolving myself. Seeing it, the myth that you see today has been uh, a byproduct or a product of growth. Mm-hmm. When I started my career, you ha- I had a very specific image or perception of what leadership looks like, and it's direct, you know, being a tall- authoritative, directing people, command and control. But as I've evolved and as I've gotten exposure and started my own company, I've realized that the leadership role is much more than that. It is nurturing, guiding, providing insights and more importantly, sharing anecdotal successes and failures. The element that I respect the most is integrity, compassion, and empathy. Now, if you can show these attributes, you will be able to lead and guide people in a much more succinct and directive way. So I want to ask you a little bit more about empathy. How has empathy changed for you, your understanding of the word empathy and your way, uh, ability to show empathy from the emit that is here with me today compared to the one that maybe existed 10 years ago? You know, empathy is something that when you put yourself in someone else's shoes, you, you, and you realize the challenges or the nuances they face, it generates and evokes a certain set of emotions. You know, whether that's good, bad, indifferent, you know, to that particular situation. And then realizing how do you address those? So if there is a, let's just say, you ask somebody to change or the job role changes or the leadership um, relationship, changes in terms of the org structure you're now reporting to somebody different Mm -hmm. how does that impact that person 
you know, how do you, what emotional roller coaster journey does that person go through? It may be for the better, that he may be getting a better leader that is more in tune with his or her success. But just because it's being dropped as a bombshell at the last minute, how does that person react to it? The ability to nurture that emotion and to help somebody and better understand why these changes are being made and, and to be fully receptive and engaged in that conversation so that when you leave, both of you feel good about that conversation and the actions that are taking place, that for me is empathy. Awesome. And, and are, do you feel that you see empathy differently today than you did in the past? I see the cause and need for having more empathy now. You know, mm -hmm. you've heard of these silent quitting, great resignation, et cetera, the turmoil that we've been thrown in by the COVID-19, the economic disruptions that have caused, mm -hmm. causes you to be, causes you to have more compassion as a leader and have, and show more empathy and not just show more empathy. It's one thing to walk the, you know, talk the talk, another right. thing to walk the talk. So you have to be able to do both because people are observing how you're responding to it and can soon find out whether you're being authentic or being fake. Mm -hmm. And for me, there's no compromise. You have to be authentic and true. Awesome. And that kind of brings me to my next question because business, the environment around us is constantly changing. Um, so what's a challenge that you've recently faced and how did you adapt or overcome it? You know, Let's let's stick with the COVID nineteen. You know, being a small company in a boutique management consulting, most of my work has been through referrals mm -hmm. and net, uh, through my network. So you have the opportunity of actually meeting a prospective client in a non threatening or non solicitation environment. You know, whether it's for lunch, dinner, tea, coffee, and you generally spark a relationship. And through that conversation, you find out some pain points and see if you can help the elevate the person, uh, elevate the issue or help uh, address that issue in a more pragmatic way. With COVID-19 and the lockdowns, obviously that opportunity or that avenue for me to pursue business was uh, somewhat restricted. So mm -hmm. I had to pivot and I decided to start writing and inking articles and sharing my thought leadership to garner additional visibility, credibility, and to evoke a response from new clients and existing clients so that we can still continue to engage at a meaningful level and uh, uh, find relationships that are mutually beneficial. Awesome. How do, you foster, how do you foster a culture of open communication and trust within your teams internally? Uh, for me, open communication and, you know, uh, you know, there are several buzzwords people use, right? Transparency and things. For me is the ability to be fearless in articulating your thoughts without replication. So if mm -hmm. there is something that's on your mind, say it, get that issue addressed, you know, whether it's a concern, a resentment, whatever, get that addressed in the right forum, in the right platform, in the right time, get a resolution to it and then move on. You know, you don't want things and neg negativity to foster because right. all it does is it just creates bad um, working relationships and then soils the culture that you work so hard to create. Mm -hmm. like, for me and my small company, it's all about collaboration. It's all about mutual trust, respect. And, you know, if you can't have objective conversations, whether they're tough conversations like conversations or a joke or two, then it makes it very difficult to continue to work as a team. Do, would you consider your culture a culture that is open to taking risk? Yes. Uh, but they are calculated risks. So I wouldn't say, you know, we do things on a knee-jerk reaction. Mm -hmm. We take calculated risks um, and we tend to be very proactive based on factual data, trends, and such. So we do a lot of landscape analyses and then jump into the foray. Mm -hmm. 
uh, as, as a leadership coach and executive coach and someone who's helping other organizations grow, what are some personal and professional growth areas that you personally are currently focusing on or hope to explore in the future? Oh, that's, uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. For me, the personal growth that I'd like to see is how do I expand my network? Mm -hmm. Um, to bring in more meaningful relationships. Um, and in terms of, you know, growth, otherwise, you're always learning, you know, so for instance, in strategy, you're always learning new ways and new ways of creating meaningful and innovative solutions for your clients. So for me, that journey continues all through. Mm -hmm. uh, and you learn from the past, you adapt for the current, and then you plan for the future. You know, and, and you can't plan way out in the future because technologies and these things evolve. So there you go. Who's been the most influential person in shaping your leadership style, your business style, and who you are today as a leader? Uh, I would attribute that to my parents. My mom and dad were strong influences for me. My dad, as I mentioned in my interview with Authority Magazine, uh, was an inspiration to me and still is. He's passed on, uh, but he was a serial entrepreneur, and some of his entre uh, some of his endeavors were not successful. But it never let him down from taking on the next one. He mm -hmm. learned from the past. He learned from his failures, adapted, and then went with great passion, and was very successful in some of the endeavors that he came up with at a later stage in his life. My mom for two things, compassion, developing relationships, uh, and nurturing them. Mm -hmm. People forget that in business, it, it just can't be uh, a one-way traffic just for business. You've got to nurture that re relationship beyond the business growth. Right. You know, how can you turn that relationship into a more meaningful and objective relationship where you become a confidant? It's not all about dollars and cents. It's all about helping the journey. The dollars and cents will come, but it's that connection with that individual in the personal space that they have, what attributes and traits that you can demonstrate that, re that they find very relatable is what's going to make you come ahead. So I, I'm going to com combine the, the both parents here in my next question. I'm going to ask you, have you ever found yourself in a situation where you basically failed in, in building the relationship that you would hope to build with a, with a potential client or a client. And what did you learn from that? Yeah, uh, you know, in consulting, there are times when you have great clients and then there are times when, unfortunately, despite your best efforts, the relationship just doesn't you mm -hmm. know, go in, a, in the direction that you want through it. Uh, I'm no exception. Um, the biggest thing that I learned from that is to cut your losses, you know, to have the strength to walk away. You know, it's it's tough because at the end of the day, we all want to serve clients. You want to make money to stay in business and stay afloat. But you also realize that if the relationship is such that or you get the the sense that the relationship is not going to go quite the direction that you want to, then to have the the in integrity and the courage and the fortitude to walk away and say, hey, look, this is not a good fit. Time for me to go away. Mm -hmm. uh, I one time ran sub subcontracted with a through a company for a healthcare service provider here in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area. And what I was told the engagement was to what it turned out to be was day and night difference, resulting in me working several, you know, a significant chunk of time unpaid. And I realized mm -hmm. from that point that, hey, look, you know, just because you want the business and you thought that this is going to be a marriage where you can rely on the other person to provide you with contracts and you deliver, you've got to be taking care of yourself in a way where by which you don't get compromised you, you signed up for a particular service you deliver on that and if it, if there's a change and have the ability and courage to re 
uh, to have the meaningful and purposeful dialogue to mm -hmm. re uh, to reevaluate what needs to be done and then go from there or walk away. Yeah, that, that, that's a tough lesson to learn because I think as consultants and, and entrepreneurs, we all learn it at some point. Like there's scope creep and then there's scope creep. <laughs> so. Yeah. The, the, and, and the key thing there, you know, uh, Cynthia, is the ability to have the courage, right? Just to say, hey, hold on for a second. Let, let's go back and evaluate or discuss what it is that we started off with. Mm -hmm. And and now, if there is a scope creep within this time, within this budget, this is what can be done. You know, there, there are trade-offs. If you want something, then something else has to go. You can't, if you allow yourself to be subjugated, people are going to walk all over you. You know, that's mm -hmm. the lesson I learned. Just right. because you're playing fair doesn't mean everybody else will play fair. Very true. And as a business owner and an entrepreneur, I, I, there could be a lot of hours, a lot of just a, a lot. So how do you find a way to balance between your professional responsibilities and your personal lives? And especially when, when like things are challenging. Um, in business, if you don't have a good mind and good health, the rest of it's just going to fall away, mm -hmm. which leads you to the emphasis of being emotionally, physically, mentally well. And that puts the emphasis in having a work-life balance. For me, there are certain relationships or contracts that I sign up with the client saying, you know, here are the working hours. You can reach me after us for this window of time. And then the clock's off. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I will respond the next day. Weekends, are my time to unwind, pick up hobbies or pursue current hobbies, uh, you know, learn a thing or two by reading a book or going to a webinar or a conference so that I, I expand my knowledge base. And uh, I find comfort in doing that. And, you know, I'm, I'm very uh, focused on having that work-life balance. You know, as a youngster, the younger I met, you know, 20 years ago would, would have just burned midnight or constantly you know, because you're ambitious, you're driven. Now, mind you, I'm not saying I'm not ambitious, okay? But it's uh, I've realized that I can't burn the candles at both ends without it having a significant impact on one or the other or both. Mm -hmm. well, what are some of the hobbies that you enjoy doing on those weekends? I enjoy uh, playing music listening to music, uh, I um, go out flying. And sometimes it's just simply going out for a cruise with, you know, on a drive. Okay, that's cool. What do you play? I, uh, I play drums. Oh, and interesting. I also enjoy traveling, immersing myself in different cultures, learning what, they, what the cultures are all about firsthand. It's mm -hmm. one thing to see it on television or see it in a movie or read about it, but it's a totally different thing when you immerse yourself and get the true life experience of a different mm -hmm. culture or visiting a different place. You know, you can see photographs of Paris and how gorgeous it is, but once you go in there, you have a totally different appreciation for the Eiffel Tower, the Notre Dame, things to that effect. Absolutely. Can you recall a, um, a piece of feedback, whether positive or constructive, that had a profound impact on your professional journey? Yeah. One of the, yeah, um, the feedback that I received is my tenacity. You know, I'm, I'm somebody that just doesn't quit. And that still is something that I keep hearing from way back when to today. Um, I'm always driven to help the client. You know, that comes first and foremost to me. And that's the reason mm -hmm. why I founded my company. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, uh, it is to help clients succeed and to establish meaningful relationships so that even after you're gone, there's enough knowledge base that you've transitioned to the client that they feel comfortable taking the journey on their own. But they, the relationship that you've also created with them also leads to comfort level where they can call you and say, hey, look, man, I'm in trouble. How do I get out of this? 
It's interesting that you brought up the word tenacity because just last week I had a, I did an executive roundtable with a, a, another group of um, dis- disruptive you know entrepreneurs who had been in part of this series and we I asked them about characteristics that they thought were, were necessary for an entrepreneur, especially a successful one. And tenacity came up multiple times. So when we talk about tenacity, what what does that mean to you, the word tenacity? No quit. You know, simply put, it's no quit. You know, you find you're going to hit obstacles no matter where you go. Even in the best client relationships or best client engagement, you're going to hit some speed bumps. Uh-huh. And, you know, to, th- there are several components to being tenacious, right? One, you can't be tenacious without knowing what the end goal is. So what is your strategic vision? That for me, and then all the effort to get to that North Star that you've defined translates into the tenacity, you know, and some of it could be, you could argue is resiliency. Some of it, you know, you could argue is simply um, perseverance, Mm -hmm. a combination of all those things add up to that tenacity. And what is the North Star that you've, set out there for yourself what is your north star my north star for my firm is to be of service to clients to help them succeed Mm -hmm. and and be successful so that's the north star for our firm and we've stayed true to it very good do you have a separate North Star for you as an individual? Because the way you answered that was like, well, for the firm, it's this. No, it's, it's the same for me as well. You know, if it's, okay. whatever, you know, for, for you, you want to be successful, right? So that's the North Star for me. Mm-hmm. Whether it's in, you, you want to be successful uh, as an individual, you want to leave legacy behind, you want to be successful in the relationships that you nurture and create, you want to be, uh, so those are the, you know, that's the North Star for me at an individual level as well. You you and I talked a little bit before we started hitting record and we were talking about how rapidly things change. And in and, and our conversation was just about like websites and how, how fast platforms change and things. So we do live in an age of, of, of innovation and now we have AI and everything's changing. So how do you ensure that you and your team stay ahead of the curve and embrace the change? So being... Being a strategy firm, or you know, we worked. Um, you know, our focus has been strategic transformation. So, in order to facilitate a strategic transformation, uh, you have to have a very good understanding of the current landscape, the future trends, and how those future trends are going to impact businesses. Mm-hmm. This is how we serve our clients, and then it's fact-based, research-based, tailored. So we don't come up with cookie cutter solutions, you know, one size doesn't fit all. So we take into account what the current situation for the current uh, for our client is, what's the current assessment of them, what are the strengths, weaknesses in terms of capabilities and skill sets, and then try to marry that with what we see is in the future. You know, and uh, you'll see that I've written a lot of articles on this, uh, on my blog posts, white papers, presentations, etc on these topics. So we do a lot of research um, to stay ahead of the curve. And uh, it has served as well. How how does an organization that's out there listening, how how do they know they're ready for transformation? Because that that can sound so out there, you know, I want to transform, but what does that mean? And how does an organization know they're ready for transformation? You know, that, that that is a multifaceted question, so I'll try to answer the best I can. Yeah, yeah absolutely. A company realizes, so let's answer the first thing. How does a company know it's ready for transformation? Mm-hmm. Um, when you do an assessment or a company, an executive of the company realizes that certain things are not going right, you know, whether their operating costs are high, that they're not meeting the profitability mar- uh, margins that they that they've set for themselves or Wall Street set for themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are issues and challenges in terms of the product, the quality of the product or service that they're putting out there. Um, there are mumblings or there's discontent in the workforce. These are all catalysts, internal catalysts 
for a change. Then also, then there are external catalysts. You know, your new product coming out or new comp competitor to doing something. Um, the COVID nineteen, you know, unforeseen circumstances like that that force you to pivot and say, you know what, we have a crisis. And the best example I can give you for that is um, the retail industry. Right? You, you take a company like Nordstrom, you take a company like Neiman Marcus and such. These are all high end retailers that pride themselves in providing personalized services to you. Now with the lockdowns and restrictions, they had to significantly change their service paradigm mm -hmm. to pivot and have a more digital uh, focused service that they could offer. And they had to tailor that and uh, the digital service, right? Because then again, one size doesn't fit all and then finding creative ways by, by which they could still meet with the compliance and the regulatory obligations that they had, but at the same time, invite people to come in in limited numbers to come to the store and then have a uh, fashion consultant work with them to do, you know, to get their needs addressed. So that is one example. Mm -hmm. You know, another example is. Uh, media and entertainment. I'm sure you, you know, you've heard of Blockbuster and its sad demise. And part of the sad demise for Blockbuster was that they did not keep up with the times. You know, kind of like Kodak. Uh, yeah, Kodak was another perfect example, right? You know, if uh, or, or uh, you know, if they had stayed, mm -hmm. uh, or Xerox for that matter, mm -hmm. or they thought. They had one of the best operating systems created by 50 engineers. It's still there in the Polo Alto labs that they have. And a lot of those elements are used by app, you know, the graphic user interface and that stuff. Um, but they decided, or the executives decided, and the sales, and they were driven by sales numbers, that we want to stick in photocopying business instead of the computer business. And take a look, one, a trillion dollar missed up opportunity. And same thing with Blockbuster. Their biggest problem was, and they failed to recognize, is that they, you know, fees, big fees, you know, you were charging up, upwards of 40 fees, and then they did not have the ability of providing you with the discs or tapes that were needed. So when you go there for a particular movie, sometimes the journey was for waste because, mm -hmm. you know, the product that you wanted to see wasn't available. Technology was evolving, and there was Napster and other companies that were coming up with a streaming option. Had they jumped onto the bandwagon, they could have gone from a brick and mortar to a click and mortar company, and the mm -hmm. rest would be history. You wouldn't have heard of Net Netflix or anything of that effect because they would be there. As a matter of fact, they actually had the opportunity for even acquiring Netflix for fifty million at one time, and they poo pooed on it. So there you go. So that makes me curious. It, it, when you work with an organization. Have you ever been with an executive who wasn't open to change, who could have been like that Kodak executive or the blockbuster executive that was really hell bent on staying, you know, on the status quo? How do you deal with that when you're working with an executive? It goes back to facts, figures, you know, understand the pain point, try to find things that are very relatable that are pet pet peeves for the for the executive and try to put a compelling argument there. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're despite putting a compelling argument, you know, some executives, as I'm sure you've you've been you know, being an executive coach have seen, they're very reluctant to let go of the way business is being done. Right? Some of these CEOs and such have a short tenure, five mm -hmm. years maybe, or you know, if they're lucky or thereabouts, and then they're replaced. In that five years, they want to make sure that they leave a legacy behind and get their golden parachute or you know whatever other incentives that are tied to their contract. Mm -hmm. um, so it becomes difficult for them to rationalize and objectivize meaningful change. I've had, you know, I've worked with an insurance company executive, and I think I've used that example in my interview as well, where yeah. They force you to go through their membership in order to enjoy some of the other benefits. Mm -hmm. That model worked, you know, 60, 70 years ago when you were providing roadside assistance and things to that effect. But 
the model now has evolved. You know, every single insurance company now provides you with roadside assistance. So that isn't a unique product or feature mm -hmm. that you can say, hey, you have to pay this annual membership in order to enjoy some other perks like insurance and uh, travel perks and things to that effect. So um, the best way to deal with a stubborn executive is state your case with facts, figures, and how would it benefit them? How would they shine if they adopt your recommendations? How would they, you know, one, what is the risk? And what glory can they enjoy after that? Okay, awesome. Do you have a favorite mantra or quote that you often turn to for motivation or guidance in your leadership journey? Change is inevitable. Okay, that's, that's it, huh? It's a short and simple one. Change is inevitable. Yeah, it, can't argue with that. It's absolutely true. And how does that motivate you? It, it keeps you on your toes. You know, even as a consultant at times, you know, you, you are set in your ways of doing certain things and it motivates you to change. You know, so if you are speaking to a client and you've put your best foot forward and, and things are not going quite the way you thought they would, what can you do better to change, mm -hmm. shift the context of the discussion? Or what can you do differently to have the client see things your way? Or what can you do better to fully understand or better understand where the client's coming and what, what are their challenges and why are they hesitant in embracing what you're proposing? What is the biggest piece of advice that you would offer to a, a, a young leader who is starting their maybe their first time in the um, their first time in a leadership role? What's the biggest piece of advice that you would offer them? Be resilient. Be resilient. You're gonna go up and down. You have to stay even king. You know, don't don't lose sight of the long term goals, right? So that North Star always comes up. Have a very clear vision of what it is that you want to do, mm -hmm. what you want to accomplish, what you who you want to serve, right? Once you have that North Star defined, then all your activities should be driven towards achieving that North Star. What is the appropriate time? for someone to hire an executive coach? For me, I think any time that you're faced with struggle is a good time to have an executive coach in there. Now, you can do it proactively to have an executive coach there so that you don't run into trouble. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when you're at crossroads and you find yourself as an as an executive or an executive team unable to reach consensus to move forward, that's a perfect time to get an external opinion and mm -hmm. somebody who is an expert such as yourself to come in and facilitate a dialogue so that whatever barriers are there, whatever minutia needs to be sorted out is, and then you have a clear direction where you need to go, what needs to be done, and who needs to do what. You can hold yourself and everybody else accountable for that journey. You know, it's interesting for me, 15 years ago when I started in this industry, it, having a coach was kind of like something people wanted to keep quiet. It's like they felt it was remedial and that, you know, it made them look weak. Now it's like, hey, I have a coach. I have a coach. Do you have a coach? Who's your coach? It's like people are really proud of having a coach. They have one on speed dial. So, so it's changed very, very much for the better. Yeah. It's the same thing with mental health, right? You know, previously the term mental health, you said, hey, I have someone is suffering from mental challenge, uh, you know. Mental health issues. Or whatever it is and needs help or what have you. That was poo-pooed upon, right? It was, hey, he's weak or she's weak and mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Um, and now it's it's become mainstream. You know, as a matter of fact, that becomes a key benefit and a differentiator at that. The companies say, you know, you can take mental, you know, mental days off, 
and uh -huh. you can you know go talk to a counselor or a, a therapist that's of your choice and blah 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 and it's an added benefit of working with our company yeah i, I just read somewhere that then i think it was france maybe that they they give women three days off for their menstrual cycles it's just like whenever that is take three days off because you could use it which i don't know if that's true but i did just hear it recently so no there, there's a huge difference in labor laws between what we have here in the u.s and in europe right yeah it's it's there you are working 32 hours mm -hmm. and they have a much better work-life balance than what we do We'll get there. So let me ask you this. What is the legacy that you hope to leave? The legacy that I want to leave behind is the successes of my clients. You know, so um, if I were to retire or if, uh, you know, when I pass on, somebody mm -hmm. would say, yes, yeah, Samith helped us build a very strong foundation for our firm or helped us during troubled times or did something to enable us to be more successful. That's the legacy I'm going to leave me on. Awesome. And then how, what, first of all, before we wrap up, I want to ask you a final question. Is there anything that you want people to know about you that we haven't talked about? Maybe something they'd be surprised to know about and how can people best reach you? All right. So I think we've covered a lot of the questions, you know, about my personality my leadership skills, how I approach and what my uh, intended legacy is mm -hmm. that I'd like to leave behind. Um, you know, what people may not recognize is that I actually started my career. It was non-linear. <laughs> I started in accounting, then went into computer science and then into management. Okay. So it's a very colorful journey. Uh, and, uh, you know, so... That, that's something perhaps they may not know. Best way to reach me is through my website. And they can find out a lot about who I am, my way of thinking, through my blog posts, the presentations that I put out, the webinars that are there, uh, articles and white papers. Are you super active on LinkedIn? I always tell people to connect on LinkedIn. Oh, yes. I, I'm active on LinkedIn as well. And they can see some of the blog posts up on LinkedIn as well. We'll make sure that we have links to all of that. Um, and what what is the, if you were to describe your ideal client, who's your ideal client? Anybody who's looking forward to working on putting a strategic transformation together. Mm -hmm. Now's the opportunity to get into thinking about how you want to relatively future-proof yourself. You know, obviously technology is going to evolve and you will have to evolve with it. But from a business standpoint, how do you future-proof your company? Those will be the ideal clients for me. You know, companies that are interested in using AI, companies that are use, you know, interested in helping digitize some of the existing core processes, uh, improving organizational efficacy. These are my ideal clients. Okay. Across, and I work. I have worked across industries. So I've worked in consumer packaged goods. I've worked with uh, clients in the financial industry, merger acquisitions with uh, biopharmaceutical companies, healthcare, media and entertainment. So um, the world's my oyster, as you say, you know, so to speak, in terms of the industries that I serve. That's awesome. So you've got a wide breadth of people that you can help. We'll make sure that there are links and ways to find you. And this video will be posted right along inside of your authority magazine uh, in, uh, article, which also has your contact information. So I'm sure people will be able to find you. And I cannot thank you enough for sharing your time with me today. I enjoyed our conversation very much. Likewise, yeah, Cynthia, thank you for the opportunity. And I recognize you squeezed me in between uh, several appointments. I know your calendar is busy. So I take, you know, thank you very much for accommodating me. And I've enjoyed this conversation tremendously as well. Well, it was very nice having this time with you and enjoy the rest of your day. Likewise. Thanks for watching the Care to Lead podcast. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and hit the notification bell for more videos and updates.